race-based slavery. Uh, it, it's been called America's original sin. It's not my characterization. Aaron Sorkin used it in the West Wing, and Joe Biden used it in his acceptance speech, and I think it fits. This past summer, many Americans have considered the idea that systemic racism is embedded in our culture and what to do about it. My aim this week and next is an attempt to better understand the force that slavery, race, and civil rights have had in our history, and do it by examining a fact-centered narrative focused on two landmark Supreme Court cases, this week Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1857, and next week on Brown versus Board of Education in 18, uh, 1954. <clears throat> so to begin, context is critical. And I'm going to start with the fact to talk about that during the 1840s and 50s, slavery was the most contentious issue in American politics, especially whether or not it would expand into the territories that weren't yet states. The political wars over slavery go back to the nation's founding. And I'll start by reviewing the pervasive role that slavery had in American politics up till 1857. I could start with the first slave's arrival in 1619, but we don't have time. Suffice it to say that slavery had been a significant and in some cases a controlling issue in much of our colonial past. Over the span of that colonial era, about 150 years, race-based slavery had engendered notions of white supremacy deep in American culture, and it continued to grow even as the legitimacy of slavery would come under attack. Although slavery was present in many Northern colonies when the revolution broke out, by the end of the Revolutionary War, it was understood that it was the primary source of labor on plantations, a Southern institution. And these plantations, by the way, were the primary economic engines that, were, that fueled America's growth at the time. Uh, so what I've done to start with is by giving you a timeline to present some highlights. So now I'm gonna share screen and put up my slideshow. Uh, how do I do this? I hit desktop, mm -hmm. uh, share, mm -hmm. okay. There we go, now I hit slideshow. Yep. Yeah. And let's see if this will work. My computer is slow and there's a little button going around with the circles. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, we've got it. Is it on slideshow now? Yes. Yeah, it, but it's not on full screen. That's what I'm trying to do, play from start. There we go. Okay. Yep. This is just my opening slide, but here's what I want to go to, the slide, the, my timeline. <clears throat> the 1783, uh, in 1783, the Treaty of Paris that formally ended the Revolutionary War granted the, the new United States all of Britain's colonial territories east of the Mississippi River and south of the Great Lakes. But only the state, the only states that were organized politically were east of the Alleghenies. So they had all this territory west of the Alleghenies that they had to figure out what to do with. And in the summer of 1787, while the Constitutional Convention was taking place, all 13 states represented in the Continental Congress that was operating under the Articles of Confederation unanimously agreed to ban slavery in the Northwest Territories. That's this area west of the Allegheny Mountains and north of the Ohio River. Southerners, by the way, didn't object because they knew that the trans uh, Appalachian lands south of the Ohio River would be open to slavery. Uh, the territories that would become the states of Kentucky and Tennessee already have slavery. Uh, and the area that became the, the rest of that area, which is uh, the current states of Alabama and Mississippi, were basically Indian country. It wasn't really thought of in, 18, uh, in 1787 that this land would be settled as quickly as it was. <clears throat> and one of the first acts that the new national government did under the uh, when once the Constitution was ratified, was it passed an ordinance? It passed a law that ratified the Northwest Ordinance, and it passed a Southwest Ordinance for the area south of the Ohio River, which was identical to the Northwest Ordinance, except it did not ban slavery. <clears throat> 
During the Constitutional Convention itself, slavery was at the heart of debates over representation, taxation, and the powers of the central government over state institutions. Southern states wanted to have their slave populations counted in determining representation in the House of Representatives, which would then impact the Electoral College. And Northerners objected, many of them. Slave owners considered their slaves to be chattel, to be property, no different than their livestock. And, it, and the Northerners, uh, Eldridge Gary of Massachusetts was one, who argued that it made no sense to include slaves if they were forever excluded from having rights. As, as Eldridge Gary sarcastically put it, given how slave owners considered their slave chattel property, uh, the same as livestock, he said, well, let's, why don't we count our horses too? Uh, but compromise became the order of the day, and it did so because there was kind of a, a, a consensus that the articles were not working and that if the freedom of this country was going to survive, it required that there be more unity. The new constitution provided a role for the set, so they compromised, and they did it in a number of ways. First, the new constitution provided a role for the central government to help put down what they called insurrections and preserve what they called domestic tranquility. These were euphemisms for slave, re slave revolts. There were slave revolts during the colonial period and the, the writers of the constitution were aware of it and they felt that the federal government should take, have, a, have a role in assisting the slave states to take care of this. Southern states would have increased political power with apportionment in the House of Representatives and in the Electoral College increased by the three-fifths rule. The rule wasn't about how much the slaves should be counted, uh, what they were worth. It was really, a, it, was a, it, was a, a, uh, it was a formula for increasing political power uh, based on a population of people who had no rights and 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 were not part of the body, were not considered part of the body politic. Taxing powers in the Constitution were limited so the central government couldn't tax slavery out of existence. One of the first lines in Article One uh, that deals with this says, and I'll quote, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, which means that they couldn't, that the federal government could not pass a tax that only applied to slaves. Because many slaves, slaves had run away during the, the Revolutionary War and there was a labor shortage in the South, the Constitution provided that these plantation interests were accorded a 20-year window before the central government could ban the importation of slaves. That's in the Constitution, as well as a fugitive slave provision, which in Article 6 says, and, I'll, and I will quote because the language is, is interesting, uh, or, or, yeah, Article 4. No person held a service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping to another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered upon claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. In other words, a slave who escaped did not become free and all the other states were obligated uh, to, you know, that, that this slave owner had a right to recover his property no matter where in the country it was. So you can see that the, uh, that the Constitution itself is full of, uh, of these provisions that basically give the apparent, legitimize slavery. This is why during the abolitionist period, Andrew Lloyd Garrison said that the, com the Constitution was a, an evil document. Uh, and it deserved no credence whatsoever. Uh, Frederick Douglass disagreed with him because he felt that the spirit of the Constitution took precedent over its words, which could be changed. You know, Sometimes events that are outside the realm of political, uh, of direct political uh, events have political consequences. And nothing in this, in, in this issue is more important than in the invention of the cotton gin. Uh, prior to eight, uh, 1793, 
processing cotton was terribly labor expensive and terribly inefficient and terribly expensive because the seeds had to be removed from the bowls of cotton by hand. And it was a, a very difficult process requiring very small movements and it took a lot of effort to get a single seed out because they were embedded very deeply. The cotton gin changed that. And it made cotton, and the fact that this came about at the same time that the Industrial Revolution is, is, is really getting underway and cotton is then able to replace wool and linen as the primary, as the cheapest primary cotton material uh, had a tremendous impact uh, on American population, uh, on America. And that's why I included in this timeline. By the, by the, by the middle of the 18 teens, slavery is either outlawed or being gradually ended in all states north of the Ohio River. And by 1819, both, most northern and all the Midwestern states north of the Ohio River had or were ending slavery and their populations were growing much faster than in the South. Remember in 1804-3, the Louisiana Purchase expanded the country to include the Trans-Mississippi Terries up to the Rockies, lands that were not covered by the Northwest or Southwest ordinances. And when the first state from that area was ready to come in, it required more deal making. <coughs> Hence the Missouri Compromise of 1820. This was a critical event because the, by this time, at the time of the Missouri Compromise, there were an equal number of southern states, of uh, slave states, and free states. Uh, and so they had parity in the Senate. Uh, even though by this time, the free state representation in the House was, was even with the three-fifths rule, was, was outpacing that of the South. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio, were all have rapidly growing populations much faster than below, than, than, than in the slave states. And when the first uh, state from that area was ready to come in, it required more deal making. Now Missouri, the Missouri country was populated mostly by people who had come from the Carolinas, from Kentucky and, and, uh, and Tennessee. And many of them had brought their slaves with them. And so by the time Missouri was ready to come into the Union, there was an explosion of anti-slavery agitation at the same time that opposed it. And so a deal was made and the, uh, brokered primarily by Henry Clay and, and John Calver and Calvin. That basically said that Missouri could come in as a slave state but no, the, the unorganized territories north of Missouri's southern border, from the, which was the, the bulk of the uh, Louisiana Purchase, the area that's noted in here as uh, green, uh, west of the Mississippi River. Let me find uh, uh, laser color red. Okay. Am I pointing to this area now? Yes. yes. Okay. This is the area that I'm talking about. That it was agreed under the Missouri Compromise that this would remain closed to slavery. The Arkansas Territory would remain open to slavery. Louisiana was already in as a slave state. Uh, Mississippi and Alabama, I don't re remember exactly the dates that they came in, but they were in the process of coming in. Uh, and it was agreed that Maine, which was part, had been part of Massachusetts, although geographically separated, would come in as a separate state. By the way, Massachusetts did not object in this. They were happy to get rid of it. They thought the Mainers were, were uh, <coughs> extraordinarily difficult people to deal with and didn't want to have anything more to do with them. So that was the deal that was made in the Missouri Compromise, that there would be parity between slave and non-slave states in the Senate and an unwritten rule that such parity would remain going forward. And that's in fact what, it, what eventually, essentially happened until 1850. Now, by the early 1830s, much of the country was swept up in a massive wave of religious fervor and an evangelical revivalism no, known as the Second Great Awakening. In the North, it led to an explosion of anti-slavery agitation, uh, which was viewed as a matter of religious-inspired morality. 
And so many petitions flooded Congress and so many abolitionist pamphlets flooded the South that during the, the latter years of the Jackson administration in the early 1830s, early and middle 1830s, Southern interests complained and many Northern politicians were put off because they saw all this agitation as threatening the Union. The result was the operation of the gag rule. Uh, come on. Oh, that's right. I got to go like this. And on the left hand side, you'll see this is the actual copy of the rule from the records of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1837. This wasn't the first time the gag rule was, was I think the first time it was adopted was in the 1835. And it says, resolved that all petitions, memorials, and papers touching the abolition of slavery or the buying, selling, or transferring of slaves in any state, district, or territory of the United States be laid upon the table without being debated, printed, read, or referenced, and that no further action whatsoever shall be taken thereon. And so this was actually a rule, a rule adopted by the House of Representatives. Now it didn't have the effect that it that, that it, it didn't have the effect that uh, it, that it wanted, that people thought it was going to have. I'm moving you guys because I need to. I want to show you the uh, why isn't this working here? Just a minute. I just screwed something up. Uh, pardon my French. Okay, on the right hand side, and I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, is a reference of John Quincy Adams' objection to the gag rule because every year when the gag rule was introduced and adopted, he would voice an objection, which led to a debate over slavery and the gag rule, which, which the gag rule was designed to affect. And he said, I hold the resolution to be in direct violation of the Constitution of the United States, of the rules of this House, and of the rights of my constituents, uh, et cetera. So that, that was the gag rule. And they also adopted restrictions on what mail would be delivered in the South. And it basically said that uh, certain uh, anti-slavery publications, especially William Lloyd Garrison's paper, The Liberator, would not be delivered in the South unless it was specifically requested. So if you had subscribed, if you lived in the South and you had subscribed to this paper and got, and, and, and and it was mailed to you, it was it would be like subscribing to the New Yorker, you'd receive it in the mail. The post office would not deliver it. You had to request it in writing. And the post office would then publish a list of everybody in that area who requested it. So it made it extraordinarily, you know, which would have caused in the South lead, lead to total social, uh, uh, you'd be socially ostracized. Okay, uh, let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to my timeline here. When Polk took the country into a war of conquest with Mexico, the country was divided on whether slavery would be allowed in any of the new territories. An Ohio congressman, David Wilmot, W-I-L-M-O-T, proposed a res resolution that was called the Wilmot Proviso that he tried to attach to a funding bill to, to uh, to, uh, to fund the war, that slavery would be banned in any new territories that would, might be acquired from Mexico. This provision, this, this resolution, he tried to attach it to every bill that would come through Congress. And every time it came up, most Northern members of Congress voted for it, and all the Southern members voted no. And it became a litmus test for aspiring politicians on both sides. And because the, uh, there was parity in the Senate and en there were enough Union uh, Northern representatives who felt that agitation of slavery was dangerous because it weakened the Union, uh, that it never passed. The war ended in early 1848 with Mexico ceding all of its territories north, uh, to the United States. Uh, why, just a minute, how do I, there we go. Uh, there we go. Okay, I, I got mine fixed. Uh, and so by 1849, 
by when the war ended in, in February of 1848, Mexico ceded all of its territory, uh, which is this orange territory uh, here, the Utah Territory, New Mexico Territory, and California to the United States. Uh, you can see it here on the left-hand side, the Mex Mexican Secession of 1848. Uh, and by 1849, California, had a, by late 1849, California applied for statehood. Uh, for those of you who know, California held a convention in Monterey in 1849 to form a state constitution. But Southerners weren't prepared to allow it because it would upset the balance. So another settlement known as the Compromise of 1850 brought some peace. And it was a number of separate laws that provided as follows. California came in as a free state. Uh, and with the understanding that when Oregon was ready, the Oregon, any states came out of the Oregon territory, they would be free states as well. Uh, which would end the, which would end the, the automatic parity in the Senate. But slavery would be allowed in the other territory acquired from Mexico, what is now became the Utah Territory and the New Mexico Territory if a majority of settlers there wanted it, what was called popular sovereignty. And a new, stronger fugitive slave law was passed that made the federal government instrumental in returning runaway slaves to the owners. The Underground Railroad had started by, by the end of the 1840s and 1850. And the opinion in the South was, was, was just, was, they were livid. Uh, that their, that northern states were complicit in uh, helping their slaves escape. And the new stronger fugitive slave law made the federal government the arbiter. It had been before this that a southern slave owner who caught, captured a slave and wanted to remove him if he couldn't do it voluntarily or by force, he had to go to state court to get an order. This changed it. It created a federal system within the federal judiciary through federal magistrates who would have the sole de ability to determine if the slave should be returned to slavery or not. The slave themselves could not testify. They were not entitled to a jury trial. And the magistrates who decided these were paid a fee uh, based on their number of cases. And the fee provided was $10 per case if the slave was returned and $5 per case if the slave was, was found, if the alleged slave was found not to be a slave. So the, the system was, was, was stacked. And this, this was the price of basically the Compromise of 1850. Uh, in arguing for passage of this law, Daniel Webster, who was coming to the end of his career, this is when he made his the union, you know, union now, union forever speech, basically arguing that this fugitive slave law was necessary in order to preserve the union and therefore he was for it. And he was one of the prime movers of, of this compromise. But Southerners were increasingly, dis, increasingly dissatisfied with the fact that the Missouri Compromise kept slavery out of the territory immediately west of slave permitting Missouri. This Kansas territory right here, much of which was, many of which was settled by uh, Missourians. In 1854, at the uh, uh, instance of Stephen Douglas, who was the, one of the leading Democrats in the Senate at the time, Stephen Douglas of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858, Congress adopted the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which again modified the Missouri Compromise. It made popular sovereignty, which had been the rule acquired for the Utah and New Mexico territory, if they ever became states, to the Kansas and Nebraska territories. But the result of this was what they could, came to be called bleeding Kansas. Uh, and these are handbills from the period uh, for both the free state and pro state handbills that were going on in Canvas. I don't know if I have a picture of, no, I don't. I thought I had a picture of some guy with a cannon. Uh, and it was called because literally Kansas uh, descended into a civil war. It was called Bleeding Kansas. 
if any of you are watching the uh, Showtime series on John Brown, that's when it's, it starts, is, is, in, is in Kansas. So this is where matters stood when the Dred Scott, when the Dred Scott case came to the Supreme Court in late 1855. So that, that's where, that, that, that's, that's my review. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to here because this is a time where I think before I get into the case and the history of the case, I'm gonna open it up for questions on this part of my talk so far. So if there's any uh, questions good. on this Yes, I, I'd like you to say a bit more about this leading Kansas. I'm not understanding what was going on then. Okay, settlers from Missouri, when, when popular sovereignty was passed in 1854, pro-slavery agitators told people in Missouri, Go to Kansas. Come on, we we want to set. We want to settle Kansas and have it a slave state. Meanwhile, settlers from free states were coming in with the same idea. And what it ended, ended up happening is between 1856 and 1857, four separate state constitutional conventions were organized and to try and write a new constitution to have Kansas come into a state. Two of them outlawed slavery and two of them were pro-slavery. And they came up for votes and the, the elections themselves were scenes of violence, ballot stuffing and everything else. Uh, one of the things that led to the Civil War is President Buchanan tried to get Kansas in as a slave state uh, and Congress wouldn't allow it. The Northern members of Congress wouldn't allow it to happen. Uh, and it wasn't, in fact, until the Civil War had begun and all the Southerners had left Congress that Kansas came into the Union in 1862 as a free state. Wow. Does that help? Yes, thanks. That clarifies for me. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? So far, keep going. <laughs> Yes, okay, I, do. I have a question, Arthur. Sure. Uh, you've mentioned Daniel Webster, but no comment regarding uh, Millard Fillmore's role in the Compromise of 1850? Uh, he, he, basically, from what I understand, and I'm, it's been quite a while since I looked at he, his role, I, I, I was pretty sure that he prepped, left it up to Congress and that what happened was it was the last deal that Henry Clay uh, tried to broker. Calhoun was against it. Uh, he was for the fugitive slave law, but Calhoun was, was actually on his, literally on his deathbed. He came in and made a speech against California's coming into the Union, and that was the last anyone heard of him. Uh, but, uh, Webster and, and Henry Clay, and it was Henry Clay's farewell kind of thing, uh, his, his swan song, because he died within a year after this, after 18, he died shortly after, uh, were the prime movers. It was essentially a, a function of Congress, as I understand it. Uh, Fillmore, I don't know what, if Fillmore had an active role in it, I'm not aware. But then I haven't read much on Fillmore in quite some time. Uh, I think he's probably the uh, considered one of the least memorable presidents. Not necessarily the worst, but certainly one of the least memorable. <laughs> so, so Ron just just told the American History Group about his reading of uh, Mil his rehabilitation of Fillmore. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We won't get into that today. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, history is always subject to revision and understanding. So one of these days, Ron, I'll talk to you about it. And you can, maybe if I'm wrong, you can refresh me. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to go on or is there any more questions? I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Let, then let's go to the case itself. And I'm going to go back to screen share here. And I'm going to go forward. Here's Dred Scott and Roger Towney, the principal actors in, in, in this case, just so you can see. I just wanted people to know, yeah, that's what they look like. Okay, this is a timeline of Dred Scott's life. 
Cases are about people, and their stories tell us a lot about their times, the, the arch of their lives. In simple terms, it's a case about a slave who wanted freedom for himself and his wife and children. Here's the timeline. Scott was born a slave in Virginia around 1800. The year of the exact year is uncertain. He was owned by Peter Blow or Peter Bow. I've heard, I've seen it written both ways. He must have been in the household rather than the, in the fields because all his life he worked as a valet and butler for most, and, he be, and as it became evident later, he had developed a close relationship with Peter's sons, which he probably only would have had if he was in the house. Blow moved frequently, first to Alabama, and then in 1830, he moved to Missouri, and he took Scott with him as his slave. Bo died in 1832, and in 1833, Scott was sold to John Emerson, who was a doctor serving in the U.S. Army. Uh, now, what had happened is Bo died with, owing debts, and was frequently happened at this time. They had this... Uh, before any property could be distributed to heirs, all the bills had to be paid. Uh, and usually the first thing that happened was the slave, slaves would be sold to, to raise money to pay the bills. And that's what happened here. From December 1933 to May of 18, pardon me, December 1833 to May of 1836, Emerson was posted first to Fort Armstrong of, was posted to Fort, Fort Armstrong in Illinois and took Scott along as his valet. Uh, in 1837, he was uh, transferred to a fort up in the Wisconsin Territory, Fort Snell, which is now part of Minnesota, uh, and took along Scott as his valet. Now, both Illinois, which is where his first posting was, and Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Territory had laws on the books banning slavery and providing that any slave brought into the jurisdiction by his master and who resided therein would be deemed free on demand. But Scott didn't try in these years to be set free. We don't know why. Maybe he was illiterate. Maybe he didn't know about the law. Or maybe Emerson treated him well and promised to free him sometime in the future. We simply don't know. While at Fort, Slim, Fort uh, Snelling, Scott married Harriet Robertson. She was a slave owned by the Indian agent stationed at the fort. The agent was also a justice of the peace, and he actually performed a marriage ceremony that was entered in the official records at that time. And thereafter, Emerson acted as Harriet's owner. Now, were they in the South, no such, uh, no such uh, ceremony would have been performed because no slave state legally recognized slave marriages. A slave was property. He had no right, and marriage was a, was a civil procedure. It was a civil contract. And it, so no, no, no slave state le uh, legally recognized slave marriages. Legal marriage undermined the slave status as property. Marriage was considered a contract and slaves had no right to enter in, into a legally enforceable contract. So it's, uh, this was an anomaly. But Emerson was posted back to St. Louis, uh, was posted back, back to St. Louis, but he left Scott in the Fort Snelling, hired out to another couple as, as, as servants. Now it was common practice for a slave for a slave owner to hire out slaves where the owner didn't have work for them or a need for them at the time. And for those of you who might have ever read, uh, uh, ever read uh, uh, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, before he escaped, he was hired out uh, in, in, in Maryland, in Baltimore, uh, to work. Uh, and as a matter of fact, at that time, the deal that Douglas made with his owner was Douglas was, was free to hire himself out, but he had to give his owner $3 a week, which was about 90% of the going wage for the kind of work that he was doing. And so this was very common. Dredd and Harriet would remain in Fort Snelling until mid-1838. In November 1837, Emerson was posted to Fort Jessup, Louisiana. There he met and, and married Eliza Irene Sanford, who went by Irene. Uh, 
they sent for the Scots who in 1838 joined them in Louisiana. Now, as an aside, Louisiana law also provided that a slave who had lived in a free state or a territory would be deemed free. But while in Louisiana, the Scots never sued for their freedom. Again, we have no idea why. While in route, Harriet gave birth to a daughter that they named Eliza after Mrs. Emerson. In October 1838, Emerson was reassigned back up to Fort Snelling, and he and Irene took the Scots along. Then in 1840, Emerson was assigned to Florida to, to serve as a doctor in the Seminole War, the, the war against the Indians in, in, in Central Florida. <clears throat> but he left. Uh, but he left Mrs. Emerson and the Scots in St. Louis. Now, Emerson was, was a complainer, and it turns out that the army kicked him out in 1842. And the Emersons moved to Iowa, but again, left the Scots in St. Louis, hired out to another family. Emerson died in 1843, and, in the high, and Irene inherited the Scots. She continued hiring them out, receiving rent for their services. They had a second daughter, Lizzie, who was born in 1846. Now, in 1846, Scott tried to buy his family's freedom, but Irene refused to sell. And it was only then that Scott filed suit in Missouri State Court to declare that he and his family were free. Again, as I mentioned, we can only guess why Scott hadn't sued earlier. Emerson might have promised Scott that Scott could buy their freedom at some point, or that he'd free them on Emerson's death. But Emerson died suddenly after a short illness. And what's interesting, remember to note, and a lot of people don't realize this, the period of the second half of the 1840s and the early 1850s were marked in the United States, especially in the central part of the country, what I would call the Mississippi Valley and Mississippi, Missouri Valley, by tremendous cholera epidemics. Whole cities were, were emptied every summer. As a matter of fact, uh, as an aside, in 1849 and 1850, I, uh, the state of Ohio had a state constitutional convention going on. It was in the process of sitting in Columbus uh, when in, this, in July of 1849, with literally no notice, it adjourned before its work was done and everybody split because of a cholera epidemic. The convention didn't re reconvene until the following winter in 1850 in Cincinnati, which was considered a little healthier than Columbus. Uh, and this was an example, and there's a lot of literature on the impact of the, of the, of the cholera epidemics at this time. Or maybe Harriet had something to do with it because while in St. Louis, Harriet attended a church whose minister had been a former slave and sued for his freedom. So that's that, that's 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 this that's uh, the dread the timeline uh, up to this point. But then you have the case, and here the two, uh, I think it's a worthwhile to look at the timeline of what happened in this case and how it got to the Supreme Court. Scott filed suit in Missouri State Court for his and his family's freedom. Remember, by this time he did so because he knew that he, his owner had taken him to both Illinois and to the Wisconsin Territory, both of which were free. And under the law at the time, if your owner took you to a free state and you resided there permanently, you, were deemed, you could be deemed free. Now, the actions were filed as separate actions, one for Jed and one for Harriet in state court. And the lawyers were hired on his behalf because Jed didn't have any money, probably by Peter Bowe's sons because as it would later turn out, they actually provided, got him his freedom once he lost to the Supreme Court. Under Missouri case law, not statute, the times that Scott and Harriet resided in free jurisdictions, with their owner's consent, served to change their status from slave to free. Case precedents in the, by the Missouri Supreme Court, as well as those in other slave states, were based on a 1772 English case, a case called Somerset versus Stewart. And in that case, the judge wrote that slavery was contrary to, to natural law, so it could only exist if supported by affirmative law. <clears throat> 
and that any slave who had been taken by the slave's owner to reside in a non-slave jurisdiction became free as a matter of law and couldn't be involuntarily returned to slavery. That's what this case in, 18, in 1772 had held. The facts of that case were that a Southern planter had gone to London to settle affairs with his tobacco broker and took his slave, his valet with him. When he went to return to the South, the valet re to refused, said, I'm not going back there. I don't want to go back to slave state. And what happened is his master tried to have to physically remove him, to remove him. And so the valet got a lawyer and sued his master for assault, for assault and battery and false imprisonment. And the court in England that, that, that finally decided the case ruled that he could, because a slave, there was no affirmative law in England that applied to, to people living in England uh, allowing slavery, that slavery would, did not exist in England and that, that uh, the slave could not be forcibly taken back to the South. In this case, yes, I'm on my uh, constitutional law class on Zoom. I can't talk. Oh, yeah. Okay, Who's... but I can't talk, Jim. Oh. Bye. Is that Florence? Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, Florence. No, no, no. No, we're not going to interrupt now? No. Okay. We, I'm going to have a break for questions in a minute, Florence, so you'll get your shot. <laughs> okay. So, the, so, so that was the law at the time. The Scots case came to trial in 1847, but the cases were first dismissed because the Scots lawyer didn't have the documents to prove Irene's ownership. Because it, you had to prove that you're a slave before you can prove you're a right to, you have a right to be free. And so the case was dismissed, but the judge ordered a new trial to give them an, another chance. Irene appealed. She wanted to keep their money. And in 1848, the Missouri Supreme Court held that granting a new trial was proper and sent the case back to the trial court. But the trial was delayed for almost two years. Why? Well, the courthouse in, the, in St. Louis had burned down, and so the court didn't have a place to sit for a while. And then the cholera epidemic that I mentioned hit. So in any event, the case did not come back for trial until 1850, two years later. By this time, Irene had remarried. She had moved to Massachusetts, which didn't allow slavery. Her husband, by the way, was, did not believe in slavery. But she wanted, like, you know, the steady income that she got from having hired out the Scots. So she appointed her brother as her attorney, in fact, John Sanford, uh, and may have given him legal ownership as well. By the way, when you look at the cases, if you ever look at them up, you'll see that his name is spelled Sanford, S-A-N-D-F-O-R-D. And that was due to a misspelling error by the clerk in the Missouri court, uh, and it had never, was never correct. In 1850, the cases again went to trial, and the jury was instructed that the Scots residing in free territories at their owner's bidding would free them based on existing case law. That was the rule at the time. Now, the rule is, it was different if the slave was a runaway, but this, there was no allegation that the Scots were a runaway. So the jury found for the Scots. Sanford, based, representing Irene, then appealed. And the parties agreed, at this time, the parties agreed that only one appeal would be taken and that Harriet would be bound by the result to simplify the case. And so the case actually came before the Missouri State Supreme Court in 1852. Now, Go back to the timeline that I mentioned about the role of slavery in American politics. By 1852, agitation, uh, anti-slavery agitation was increasingly fervent in the North. Pro-slavery agitation was in increasingly fervent in the South. The country was increasingly divided. And so what happened when the case got to the Missouri Supreme Court? The court ignored 28 years of its own precedence and reversed the verdict, verdict 
the opinion acknowledged that if Scott had sued in Illinois or Wisconsin, he'd have been declared free. But as far as the Missouri Supreme Court was concerned in 1852, the status of being a slave reattached when he, was, when he voluntarily returned to Missouri with his owner. This was purely political. The court called the abolitionist agitation over slavery in Missouri and the rest of the country, quote, a dark and fell spirit in relation to slavery that if successful would result in the overthrow and destruction of our government. Under such circumstances, it does not behoove the state of Missouri to show the least consequences to any measure which might gratify this spirit. So in other words, the Missouri Supreme Court in 1852 ignored its own precedents and basically said that if, if a slave is returned to Missouri by his owner, his, the status reattaches, even if he lived with his owner's consent in a free territory. So what did Scott do? Well, again, represented by lawyers paid by his first owner's sons, he filed a complaint now in federal district court for damages for false imprisonment under diversity jurisdiction. Now, Article Three, Section 2, which is what establishes the federal judiciary, says the, the judicial power shall extend, in other words, the judicial power of the federal courts extends to all cases in law and equity arising under this constitution, the laws the United States and treaties made or should be made under their authority. So, but this is not a case arising under federal law. But then it also says, to controversies between citizens of different states. So in other words, the, the Constitution provided that federal courts would be allowed to hear cases in federal court where the, the parties are citizens of different states. This is called diversity jurisdiction. And the idea in the Constitution uh, was to create a level playing field. The idea was this, if a guy who lives in, in, in Virginia, you know, wants to sue somebody who lives in Massachusetts, and that person lives in Massachusetts, he has to do so in Massachusetts state court. And there's a high probability that local judges are gonna favor local parties and he get what they lawyers call hometown. Uh, and this is the basis of, of, of diversity jurisdiction, that it provides the federal court as a more neutral venue for citizens of, of suing in different states. Now, because Sanford was a resident of New York and Dred Scott is, a, is in Missouri, he claimed diversity jurisdiction and sued in federal court. And the suit for damages was a completely, and it was damages for false imprisonment. But this is a legal fiction, because if the jury finds in Dred Scott's favor, it's implied that he was free. His argument, Scott's argument was that he was freed automatically when he was taken to reside where slavery was outlawed, and Missouri had no right to declare the slavery re reattached to a man already free. Sanford's lawyer argued that the federal court shouldn't even hear the case because every key issue had been decided by a final judgment of the state court. Remember, whether or not he is a slave or not is a function of state law. And this defense is called a plea in abatement. The, and, and the Stanford's lawyers were arguing that, hey, Missouri law had already decided this issue. There's no federal issue, and under Missouri law, he's still a slave. The federal court in diversity jurisdiction is bound to, to, to uh, find by the law of the domicile where, where the case is held. And under Missouri law, which the federal court's bound to apply, Scott is, the case is over. And the federal trial court allowed the case to go to trial, but after the evidence was in, he instructed the jury that Scott's status was determined under Missouri law, which had already determined that he was a slave. Needless to say, the, sir, the jury found for the defense because of this choice of law program. So in 1855, Scott appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, his Missouri lawyers couldn't, uh, couldn't take up the case, 
but he got a lawyer in Washington, D.C. To, uh, to represent him. And the lawyer he got was a guy named Montgomery Blair. Uh, Montgomery Blair's father, Preston Bear, had been a free soil Democrat and was a co-founder of the New Republican Party that was founded in 1854, when, the year before this case came up to the Supreme Court. Uh, how many, for those of you who saw the movie Lincoln, remember there's a scene in the movie where Lincoln goes to meet with Preston Blair to get his support for the anti-slavery anti constitutional amendment. And the price for Blair's support is that Blair gets to go down south and try and get the, uh, somebody in the south to make, to, to make freedom. And Montgomery Blair, who had been in Lincoln's cabinet but had been tossed out for, for, for uh, uh, ethics reasons, was, was, it was in that scene. But that's the same Montgomery Blair, just so you, for those of you who want to put a face with it or uh, remember that. Blair was a very, very famous guy. Now, Blair asked other lawyers fighting against slavery to assist him, but they all turned him down. Their consensus was that, let me stop the share. Their consensus was that the case was a loser. The Supreme Court would rule on narrow grounds to affirm the lower court's decision against Scott. And no one imagined that Roger Taney, would, Taney, the Chief Justice, would try and use the case to settle once and for all the status of slavery in the territories. Uh, okay, uh, it's now been about an hour. I've got a break here for questions, and then I think we can take a break, or we can have a break and then have questions. Okay. Any more questions up to this point? I've given you now the lay of the land, what, what the case is about, how it got there, the political context that was behind the case at the time, all of which has a play on what happens next. So, Arthur, I was I'm surprised about this idea that you, if you took a slave to the North, they could just declare themselves free. Did this happen very often? I oh, would, yeah. And, I, Northern, and Northern court, up until the fugitive slave law, you see, what, ha what would happen is this. Once it became clear that, that, that Southerners who took the slaves north were at risk of losing their slaves, they stopped taking them north. Okay. And so by the 1850s, the vast majority of slaves who, were, who, who questioned their status in north, while in the north were runaways. And this rule didn't apply to runaways. Uh, if you, under the Constitution, if you were a runaway slave, you were, you, you, the, the Constitution provided that the other state couldn't prevent you, the, your, your master from recovering you. And under the new fugitive slave law that was passed in 1850, it made it a crime, and I'll get to this, for, for anybody in the North to, to, to fail to assist you. So if you knew where a slave was hiding out and you were asked, where is that slave? And you didn't tell them, you were guilty of a, of a, fel of a, federal, of a federal offense. If you helped that slave escape, if you transferred him in a wagon and helped him hide out, you were guilty of a crime under the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. Uh, and this was a major, major bone of contention that I'm gonna to get to. Okay, other questions? Anybody? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Okay, uh, I'm sure we'll get more. I see two people on chat. Is there anything down here on chat? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Oh. Why no, but I, Ron, I got yours. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> let me, then how do I get it? There we go. Okay, uh, shall we take a break? Okay. Uh, it's 10.56, out to everybody again, Barry? Uh, yes, I will, let's see, here we go. I will mute all, okay, done. Now, I've now unmuted myself, you can all hear all right. me? Yep. Okay. Okay, so now we're back, and hey, we, we're up to 50, we're at 56, that's great. I uh, hope I'm not boring you too much. <laughs> okay, 
There's an axiom that one of the most important attributes of an effective lawyer arguing before the Supreme Court is the ability to count to five, uh, as long as there's nine of them. So the court's makeup is always important. Today, the court is divided on party lines. Uh, with deeply conservative justices appointed by Republican presidents and liberal justice appointed by Democrats. But in the 1850s, the, the, uh, the split was sectional entirely. Uh, so here's the court. And as you see, it's very, very heavily weighted with Southern justices. Only two justices, McCurtis from um, Massachusetts and McLean from Ohio, were in favor of limiting slavery. It's also, I think you should remember, remember that between 18, 1788 and 1856, only two presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, were neither were either not, neither southerners or pro or pro southern in their pro slavery in their outlook. Uh, mm. uh, William Henry Harrison was from Kentucky. Zachary Taylor was from Kentucky. John Tyler, who became president, typically uh, when Harrison died, uh, was a Virginian. Uh, Millard uh, Fillmore was 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 what, was what they called a butternut. Uh, he was not from a pro from a slave state, but he viewed he viewed the Union as much more important than slavery, and had no objection and and, and did not object to slavery. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was became a nominee of the uh, of the uh, Know Nothing Party, which was anti-immigration, anti-Catholic. Uh, and Franklin Pierce, who was the only other northerner, was from New Hampshire, but he was very definitely pro-slavery and definitely strongly in favor of the fugitive slave law. So, that's, so this is the makeup of the court, and it's really important. <coughs> the appeal was set to be heard in the 1855-1856 term. Arguments were set for, to take place in February of 1856. The briefs were focused on two questions. Could Scott or any slave be a citizen for the purposes of diversity jurisdiction? And did Congress have the power under the Constitution to prohibit slavery in federal territories, which it did for the Wisconsin Territory under the terms of the uh, Missouri Compromise? Politics now enters the picture, and I mean really dirty politics. Neither James Buchanan who was a Democratic nom candidate for president, nor Roger Tawney, uh, and the majority of the justices, they didn't want a decision that would become an issue in the 1856 presidential election. So after hearing arguments in February of 1856, the court put the case over for further argument in the 1856-1857 uh, term. The idea being that they would argue the case sometime after October, the beginning of October in 1856, sometime in October or November, and the decision wouldn't come until well after the election. So the court again put the case over and asked for re-argument on the citizenship question. Buchanan wins the case, wins the election in a landslide. Here's the election of 1856. Uh, he wins it over John Fremont, who was the nominee of the new Republican Party which existed for one reason. It had one central area in its platform, that slavery should not be allowed to expand beyond the 15 slave states where it already existed. But the inauguration in those days didn't occur until the first week in March, March 4th. Uh, remember, for those of you, you know, none of us are old enough to remember, but uh, that the date was changed to January 20th by constitutional amendment during Franklin Roosevelt's first term. The dead period between November, the November election in March of 18, uh, March of 1932, 1930, uh, 1933 was too long. And so the, 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 the Constitution was amended, the states agreed, and they passed an amendment moving the inauguration up to January 20th. One of Buchanan's 
close political allies was Justice Greer. He had kept Buchanan informed of the court's deliberations, and Greer passed on to Taney that Buchanan preferred that any decision be announced after the inauguration. By the way, there's letters in the record in, in their records of correspondence that attest to this. This was nothing, uh, you know, this was nothing that was kept totally secret. Uh, there was communication between Buchanan and the court during while this case was pending. Now the court could have dis, dis, disposed of the case on very narrow, non-controversial grounds. First, it could have held that the plea in abatement should have been granted. After all, the Missouri state courts had issued a final judgment and under Missouri law that Scott was still a slave. And although the issue wasn't raised on an appeal, the, on appeal, the Supreme Court can always toss a case on its own motion if it finds that it was without jurisdiction. Uh, for those of you who, uh, those of you may remember that when the California case against Prop of the Eight came to the Supreme Court, the court refused to address the merits of that case and instead found that the proponents of Proposition 8 didn't have standing and threw the case out. That's why California had legal, legally gay marriage before, uh, for a year before the entire country did uh, under the Obergefell case, which is what I'm going to talk about in the, in, in the last class. So if, in other words, the 1850 Supreme Court case, Strader versus Graham, S-T-R-A-D-E-R-G-R-A-H-A-M, in 1850, that held that other than runaway slaves, every state had the right to control the status of persons who resided therein. Therefore, if Scotch resided in Missouri when the case began, Missouri of law applied, period, end of case. And after oral arguments the second time around, Justice Nelson from New York circulated a draft opinion against Scott based on these procedural issues. But here's where regionalism comes into effect. Taney and the other pro-Southern justices saw the election as a mandate that rejected the Republican platform. And Taney decided to draft a more expanded, expanded opinion that he and the other four Southern justices and incoming President Buchanan wanted to settle the slavery issue once and for all. Taney and Buchanan both understood that slavery had been this divisive political issue that was tearing the Union apart. In pre every year, it got worse and worse. And their idea was that if we can settle this, turn it from a political issue into a legal issue and have the Supreme Court come down and give the final issue as a matter of law, that that would settle it once and for all, and all this political, dis, uh, political divis divisiveness would end. And so Tani and the Southern Justices, and probably Buchanan himself, uh, decided to do this. And Tani Buchanan, who was in regular contact with Justice Greer, persuaded Nelson of New York, along with Greer, to join in the opinion to make it appear bisectional. In other words, the opinion was announced on March 6th because Buchanan didn't want it to appear before his inauguration, two days after the inauguration. And as a matter of fact, in his inauguration, in his inaugural address, Buchanan said that the Supreme Court is going to make it shortly tell us what the law is on this and we should all obey it. So he knew what was coming. And so two days after his inauguration on uh, March 4, 6, 1857, the court ruled against Scott and held. And, and here were the holdings. First, the Constitution's framers never intended that Negroes were citizens of the United States, with, regardless whether some Northern states allowed them to be citizens of their particular state. Thus, Scott lacks standing to sue in federal court. And let me give you the language that Tawny, and this is the way Tawny expressed the language. Negroes were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution and can, and therefore claim, and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. <laughs> 
On the contrary, they were at that time considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges but uh, those as to which those who held power and the government might choose to give them. Tani, a, who had been a former slave owner, just felt that, that African Americans had no inherent rights whatsoever. The second point that Tawney makes is that Congress did not have the power to, to uh, prohibit slavery in the territories. I'm going to stop to share for a minute because it's going to be a while till I get back to it. They, so Tawney argues that Congress did not have the power under the Constitution uh, to prohibit slavery in federal territories, and accordingly, the Missouri Compromise itself is unconstitutional. <clears throat> First, Tawney wrote that, the con that there's language in the Constitution that says that Congress can adopt rules and regulations for federal territories. But he argued that this was simply a means for a method of organizing a territorial government that would keep things running until the territory could become a state. That any decision to allow or forbid slavery would belong to the voters in such territory. And he focused the argument in one way on where the language was contained. For those, if you look at the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 is the key section that defines the powers of the federal government. It starts, the Congress shall have the power to, and then it goes on for a page and a half uh, up until to say what Congress can do. And nowhere in Article, Article 1, Section 8, does it mention the territories. The right section about the territories is contained in section three of article four, which is kind of the catch-all provision that, that says Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, period. And so, so Tony is making the argument because it's not in section, uh, section eight, Article 1, Section 8, that it's really limited, and that the right to forbid or, 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 or allow terror slavery belongs to the settlers. Uh, in, so therefore, Congress was not intended to have the power to prohibit slavery, so it couldn't. The other set point he makes is that federal territories have a duty to treat all U.S. citizens equally. And every citizen is entitled under the Fifth, Fifth Amendment, the, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, to due process, that the federal government can't take his property without due process of law. And therefore, if, the, if a Southerner were to take his, his, his property that's lawful in the state where he lives to a territory, it's a denial of due process if he loses that property without compensation. So. Uh, so by extension, a person cannot be deprived of property that's lawful where he resides without compensation, merely because he should find himself in, another, in, in one of the territories that, that maybe didn't have the same rules regarding property. This was a due process argument. Well, you can see where this is going, because Northerners saw this as saying, yeah, well, hey, if it applies to the territories, then it applies to the, to the state that if a, if a territory can't deprive a, a Southerner of his property, then neither can a Northern state. And so what happens, what Taney, Taney is in effect saying is that a Southerner's right to a slave property is a right that the federal government and the states are obligated to respect. Justice McLean and Curtis dissented. dissented. McLean recited the traditional anti-slave review going back to Somerset versus Stewart, that slavery can only be established by positive law and cannot exist without it. Slavery is exclusively a state institution that isn't protected by the Constitution outside the states where it already exists. 
and therefore that the territories have a right to, to uh, that Congress has a right to exclude slavery from a territory just as much as it has a right to allow it, and that Scott became free when his master took him to Illinois and moved into Missouri, which was the Missouri law at that time that he was taken there. And once he's free, he's always free. And Curtis's opinion ran 70 pages, 16 pages longer than Taney's majority opinion. And he took apart Taney's argument point by point. And their dissents were widely disseminate, disseminated in the North. Now, as I mentioned, Taney and the pro-slavery justices, as well as President Buchanan, wanted to settle once and for all the issue of slavery by transforming it from a political issue to be fought over in elections to a legal judicial issue over which the Supreme Court would have the final word. As a political issue, it was tearing the country apart. And Taney and Buchanan hoped that by deciding it as a legal question, Americans would come to accept it, albeit grudgingly. Were they right? Well, yes, they were right. The differences over slavery were tearing the country apart. But Taney and Buchanan were dead wrong thinking that this case settled anything. Where Taney and his fellow Southerners and Buchanan got so wrong was in thinking that disputes over slavery could be decided as a matter of constitutional law. For one thing, Taney's opinion was really weak on both the law and history. Northern opponents emphatically noted that the broad ruling was entirely unnecessary to decide the case. It's an axiom of jurisprudence that judges are supposed to decide cases on the narrowest possible grounds to dispose of the matter before the court. And the first question in any case in federal court is, does the matter belong there? Do the parties have jurisdiction and if they are under diversity, and if they don't, is a federal question involved in the case? And here the answer to that is no. There's no federal question, and therefore the case is moved. As a, the case is, is over. The, every issue in this case is decided under Missouri law. The Missouri Supreme Court has made that decision. It's its decision to make, and therefore the case should be over. If Scott's status is either a slave or free as to determine by Missouri law, there's no federal question. So the case should be thrown out without trial. And so this is, so this is one reason where Tawny's opinion goes way overboard. Now, it's, the rule is that when a judicial decision announces ideas or principles that are not necessary to decide the case, those those provisions, those statements are called dicta, D-I-C-T-A, which are not binding precedent. So whether under binding federal case law precedents, one, whether one's a slave is just determined by state law. If Scott was a resident of Missouri, Missouri law applied in this case. So Northern opinion saw Tantani's arguments and pronouncements on citizenship and the scope of Congress's power to make laws for the territory as dicta, unnecessary to decide the matter. So they were superfluous. They had no power as precedents that must be followed. Northerners also noted the fallacies in Tantani's arguments that Curtis laid out in his dissent. First, there's no evidence that the framers and founders ever considered whether non-whites could or couldn't be citizens. Most of the framers, like all Americans at that time, understood that race-based slavery was part of American life and had been for some time. But they also knew that every state had a population of free whites, free blacks living among them. And that many states, New England specifically, and even New York, allowed states, adult male blacks, to vote on an equal basis with adult male whites. It's a name to say that persons having the right to vote for members of the House of Representatives were not citizens of the country. And keep in mind that voting, con the Constitution leaves voting qualifications to the states. Voting didn't become a federal issue until the 15th Amendment was adopted in, the 18, in 1870. Secondly, 
As to the territories, Northerners argues that the states operating under the Articles of Confederation in 1787 had unanimously adopted the Northwest Ordinance, which provided that slavery would not be allowed in the territory west of the existing states east of, that were east of the Mississippi River and north of the Ohio River. After the Constitution was ratified in its first session of Congress, the new government passed a law that ratified the Northwest Ordinance and passed a similar ordinance for the territory south of the Ohio River, river that was identical except that it made no mention of slavery. Both ordinances provided for creating territorial legislatures, territorial courts, rules for elections, rules for dealing with Indian nations, and the means and the processes that would be required for applying for statehood. And no act or regulation adopted by Congress for the terror for any territory had ever been held to be beyond Congress's power to make rules and laws for the territories. And so therefore, Tawney's argument that Congress didn't have power to regulate the territory, slavery in the territories, simply didn't hold water. So those were the two principal weaknesses on legal terms. But putting aside the legal witnesses of Tawney's opinion, Tawney and his fellow justices failed to realize just how far apart Northern and Southern societies has grown as a result of slavery. We've seen how slavery was at the core of many, if not most of the major political conflicts for the 73 years between 1787 and 1856. Over these years, over those years, Largely due to the presence or absence of slavery, deep cultural differences came to divide both Northern and Southern cultures and their societies. And principally, one of the most important ones is the idea of upward mobility. Upward mobility was an essential goal and at the height of masculine self-identity and self-worth, both in the North and the South. For a young Southerner, who wanted to as aspire, his aspiration was to become the ideal Southern gentleman. That was a planter, the owner of a, of a, of a, uh, the owner of a plantation, meaning land and slaves. The most respected Southerners, the men with the most standing and power, were the elite planters. To become one, a man needed to acquire both land and slaves. But by the 1840s and 1850s, most decent land in the slave states fit for large-scale cultivation. Large-scale cultivation was both expensive and hard to come by. It was already taken. And as cotton production became ever more profitable, the cost of slaves rose as well. Economic historians have verified that by, that by 1860, the market value of Southern slaves, the 4 million Southern slaves, exceeded the market value of Southern real estate. The market value of Southern slaves exceeded the market value of, Southern, of Northern manufacturing enterprises. 40% of the national, the country's gross national product was in cotton. It, would, it provided the vast majority of, Ameri uh, of Americans' balance of trade, uh, of Americans' positive balance of trade. No wonder that Southerners demanded that slavery be allowed in the territories where they, and they, and they even wanted the United States to take over Cuba. And there were actually what they called filibusters or uh, Southerners who went to Cuba and tried to promote rebellions from Spain and tried to get Congress to take it over because they, need, they recognized that for slavery to grow, it needed a place to grow. It was already tapped. It was already tapped out in the same, in the south. And southern young southern men. This is what how they became how how they how they became. This is how they acquired status. And southern culture was both patriarchal and fixated on the idea of manly honor. It was an affront to a southerner's honor that his property could be taken from him without compensation should he travel with that property to the free territories <coughs> or to any of the northern free states. And southern writers harped on this throughout the southern press. A northerner's property was respected and protected if he came to the, south, to the south, if he brought his property, his goods, his chattels to the south, and someone stole them or, or they were lost, people, the, the, the southern society would protect it. But the reverse was not the case. 
Northern resistance to slavery and Northern refusal to protect the Southerner's property and preventing the Southerner from recovering his lawful property as required by the Fugitive Slave Law was an affront to honor not to be abided. And you see this in the Southern press at the time that there were instances where Northerners would break few sl slaves out of jail uh, this happened several times in Syracuse. There's actually a statue in Syracuse, Virginia, to what's called the Jerry Rescue, where a young slave who was captured under the Fugitive Slave Law was broken out of jail by, by agitators and taken across the Ontario River. And the guys who did it were actually charged with, a, with an offense and, and, and were, were tried in, in federal court because, under the Fugitive Slave Law. But Northerners aspired too. In the North, status for a young Northern man was to, grow, was to be an entrepreneur, to grow a business, to compete in free markets. It was called free labor. And no one expressed this be better than Lincoln. Let me go back to share screen here and give you uh, an idea of what I'm talking about here. This was a speech that Lincoln gave before the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society in 1859. The, the prudent, penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. This saves advocates as free labor. The just and generous and prosperous system, which opens the way for all, gives hope to all in energy and progress and improvement of condition for all. If any continue through life in the condition of a hired laborer, it is not the fault of the system, but, but, but because of either a dependent nature, wa, nature which prefers it or in providence, folly, or singular misfortune. Now, the first half of this is the mantra of free labor. And by the way, I would argue that at some point in time, those who consider that the second part of this is kind of the dark side of the Protestant ethic. But I, that's for, a, for, for another argument that we could have sometime. Slave labor was anything but free. This was the mantra of the, 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 the new Republican Party, was the, the free, uh, and the, 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 the motto of the party was free land, free labor, free men. Slave labor was anything but free, and no Northern entrepreneur could hope to compete with people who didn't have to pay their workers and could require them to work longer hours under conditions that no wage worker would accept. And Northerners conflated free labor with religious morality. Remember, the Second Great Awakening swept through the North. Uh, the up area around the Erie Canal is called the Burnt Over District because it was when every year when the, when the, the uh, canal froze over and commerce came to a halt, there was nothing to do, but everybody went to church and religious revivalism was the order of the day. This was called the Second Great Awakening. And Christian teachings were imbued in American culture. I mean, you have to realize that it, it, American children learned to read from the King James Version of the Bible. This was part of their cultural heritage. They didn't have Dick and Jane and Spot go, Dick and Jane books. They had, they had McGuffey's Reader and the King James Version of the Bible. Northern opponents northern opponents of slavery believed that Adam, on Adam and Eve's fall from grace, God commanded that people would now have to earn their bread by the sweat of their brows, not by taking the toil of others held in bondage. Work, entrepreneurship, was part of living according to God's law and was to be valued, to be protected and promoted. To northerners opposed to slavery on moral grounds, southern planters were sinners living off the toil of their enslaved laborers. Uh, interesting, the leaders of the convention that met in Monterey in 1849 to draft California state constitution in 1849 were Southerners. And many of the leaders actually went back to the South to fight for the Confederacy when the Civil War broke out. Yet from the outset, the delegates in Monterey in 1849 unanimously agreed that California would be a free state. It was a matter of competition 
In the first years of the gold rush, before there was any form of government, slave owners and their slaves were made unwelcome in the mining camps, often at the point of a gun. And although Californians, <coughs> the, 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 uh, the move was it would be a free state, they considered a motion that would ban the importation of free, that the immigration of free African Americans into California. And actually, it was voted on affirmatively on the, at the beginning of the convention, but then later tabled and voted against when they realized that this would prevent their acceptance in the Union. And so Northern anti-slavery advocates spoke of honor as well. Their honor was violated by the 1850 fugitive slave law that made it a federal crime if a northerner were to aid and abet a runaway slave or to re refuse to cooperate in the slave's recapture. And the idea that northern states would be required to abide slavery was an affront to their honor. They, they had the right to make the laws that applied in their communities. And if we want to exclude slavery in our state, you can't force us to accept it merely by bringing your slaves here and saying that you must allow me to keep them as my slaves or you have to compensate me for it. So you can see that there was these, this fundamental strong division between Northern and Southern mental cultures that went to the heart of masculine identity, that went to the heart of what was honorable. What, what was it that, 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 that you aspired to be? And so when the Dred Scott opinion was announced, it was immediately lauded throughout the South, and Southerners spoke, started beginning to spoke of succession if Northerners refused to accept it as the law of the land. In the North, it was excoriated as both bad law and affront to Northern dignity and Northern rights. Northern newspapers, Newspaper editorials pointed out that the logical extension of Tawney's due process argument was that a Southerner's right to slave property must be protected everywhere in the country and take precedence over Northern anti-slavery laws and therefore make slavery a national institution. Many Northerners who flocked to the new Republican Party looked at the federal government, looked at recent history, and concluded that there was a slave power that had control all branches of the federal government. Uh, no, I'm screen sharing. Oh, here we go. Congress was tied up by Southern filibusters in the Senate. Every president but two, the two Adamses, had been a slave order holder or supported slavery. And Southerners had always been a majority on the Supreme Court. This idea of a slave power conspiracy was part of Lincoln's argument in his 1858 House Divided speech that began. Lincoln's rise to national providence. And here's an excerpt from it. And remember, he's arguing, Lincoln's arguing that a, the country cannot exist half slave and half free. We cannot absolutely know that all those exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert. But when we see a, a lot of framed timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out of different times and places by different workmen, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, for instance. Stephen being Stephen Douglas, author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Franklin being Franklin Pierce, president from 1853 to 1857, who used federal troops to enforce the fugitive slave law. Roger being Roger Taney, author of the Dred Scott decision. And James being James Buchanan, who tried to get Congress to admit Kansas as a slave state and was behind the scenes in promoting the Dred Scott decision. That when we see these timbers joined together and see that they exactly map the frame of the house or mill, all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places and not a piece too many or a piece too few, not omitting even scaffolding or if a single piece be lacking, we see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared for it. In such case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or, or draft drawn upon before the first blow was struck. This is the argument of the, that became the idea of the slave power. 
uh, language that, 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 that the screenwriter in the movie Lincoln used, put in Lincoln's last word, he said, you must disabuse yourself of the slave power. Now, the Dred Scott had gone down as the worst in our history. And Taney's rep, Taney's reputation was fixed as the worst chief justice ever. As I pointed out last week, not all his decisions were all that bad, but this one certainly was. The Dred Scott decision didn't settle the issue or make the Republican Party irrelevant by holding unconstitutional its primacy, primary issue of banning slavery in the federal territories. And remember, that was the, that was the idea, of the, the whole idea behind the Dred Scott case was to moot the primary platform of the Republican Party, which was founded on the idea of, uh, of, of, free, la of, free, of, free, of uh, free labor. The exact opposite was the case. The case unified the North, raised the Republican Party to majority status in all the free states, and gave Lincoln an electoral college majority in 1860 with but 43% of the national vote. And here you, you, you see it laid out. Lincoln did, didn't get a single electoral vote from any of the 15 slave states and was not even on the ballot in 11 of them. Mm -hmm. Southern succession and civil war followed. Slavery was so embedded in America that it could only be extinguished by blood. And as Lincoln said in the second inaugural address, and the war came. Uh, so that's, that's really my take on the Dred Scott case. Next time we'll continue the story picking up with the end of post-Civil War Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and, the, and what led to Brown versus Board of Education. But this was, my, this was my take on Dred Scott, where it fits in our history, how it happened, why it happened the way it did, and why it has gone down as the most uh, notorious and probably wrongly decided case in American history. And uh, for that, I will open it to questions and comments. Lou, Lou, unmute yourself. Oh, you're still muted, Lou. There we go. <laughs> Why don't you just unmute everybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to, uh, I love the way that you, you present history. It's just so fascinating. Uh, I think one of the things that I would like to do is add just a little um, emotion to my feelings, uh, uh, to our feelings. I, I know many of you have read uh, the, the um, Toni Morrison's Beloved. And you know, it was built based upon uh, a woman, Margaret Garver was her name, who lived in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Um, she and her family were slaves in Kentucky and they had somehow escaped and gotten across the Ohio River into an, uh, Ohio uh, in 1856. And <laughs> was indeed federal marshals that went to uh, recover those, her family and take them back to Kentucky. And uh, she murdered one of her daughters rather than have her returned to slavery. And that's the story of what happened in real life, which was the basis for her, her novel, Beloved, uh, Under the Fugitive Slave Law. And I would like to go on and say a couple of other things briefly. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of the Northern Christian churches being behind um, abolition is really an interesting story. And it's one that I received from my um, schooling as a kid. But um, I also grew up in Oklahoma, which was, of course, Indian territory and more or less influenced by the Southern kind of thought, I suppose. Um, but my grandfather hosted, I'm not proud of this, but it's a, an interesting artifact of history. My grandfather hosted a KKK initiation on his farm and uh, 10,000 uh, Ku Klux Klanners attended it. 
And the keynote speaker was a, a Methodist minister from uh, Burke Burnett, Texas. And there were many, many, many Christians who were in attendance and being initiated. Um, so it's a, it's a more complex thing. It's than very that. complex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and um, you, you raise issues that I could talk on for, for hours and that I, I've had. You know, one of the first things that, that I learned in this is that when you're preparing a talk like this, you're not <laughs> trying to download your brain. <laughs> and you have to stay on message. Uh, you know, you, this is, a lot of things are right. You know, Oklahoma, it, Oklahoma history is very, is very conflicted. Uh, there's the, the, the Tulsa massacre. Uh, which I'm going to talk about next time <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> as part of, you know, part of, you know, what happens after Dred Scott, because how does Jim Crow come to be? What is the role of the court? Because the, the, the theme of my course is, is, of these four lectures are, are Supreme Courts that either bring about or reflect major trends or changes in American life. And of course, I'm using the middle two lectures to deal with this whole issue that, 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 that deals with race and, and, and America's original sin. Uh, Other questions? <clears throat> uh, let's see, Nancy Kay. <clears throat> um, I just wanted you to explain the um, cartoon that was next that you showed in the last slide. Oh, okay. It was a cartoon of, do, or do, let me go back to, let me go find it again. Oh, shoot, I, I think I, you know what I did? I closed that file and it would okay. take me a while to reopen it. Uh, the cartoon was from a Northern newspaper on the election of 18, of 1860. And what it shows is that four, there were four candidates uh, believe it or not, in that election. There was the Republican ticket of Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, there was the, the Northern Democratic Party, which nominated Stephen Douglas. There was the new Constitutional Union Party, which nominated a guy named Bell out of Tennessee. And there was the Southern Democratic Party that, Norder, that, that nominated Roger Bre uh, 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 the former vice president uh, 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 Brockerton uh, uh, of Chicago, uh, Kentucky, uh, and the map is 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 the, is the four of them tearing the uh, tearing the the country apart. That Douglas, Breckinridge, and Douglas Lincoln, Bre Douglas and Breckinridge are tearing the country apart, and Union and Bell of the Constitutional Constitutional Union Party is trying to put it together, uh, and. He, his argument, Bell was trying to run on the idea that, well, why don't we just constitutionally protect slavery where it exists and make this problem go away? Which, of course, no Southerner would agree to because that meant it couldn't expand, and no Northerner would agree to because that meant that, that it, they could never end it. Uh, but that was the cartoon. It was showing how the 1860 election, the country was so fractured that it was tearing the country apart. Okay. Other questions? Not seeing anybody here. Uh, okay, Lou, go again. Yeah, if there's no one else has a question, <laughs> I have one. Um, I'm kind of wondering about the um, communications that were going on between the uh, Tawny and um, Buchanan when they were occupying such important places in two different branches of our government. Well, uh, we don't do, we, we kind of say that we don't do that anymore. And I'm wondering what happened since then that seems to have changed the point of view that we now hold about the separation of those two branches of government. Well, they believed in separation then too, but, but they also, but, but they were, they were they were political allies, and I'm not convinced that 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 isn't that that still doesn't hold true to some extent today. I'm convinced that 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 during Clinton's impeachment that, that Rehnquist may have been in, in communication with uh, uh, with 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 with, Re with Republican leadership. 
I know that uh, Nixon, uh, when he was president, uh, at one point Thurgood Marshall, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, uh, there at one point Thurgood Marshall uh, was very ill and was in Walter Reed Hospital. And Le Nixon sent a, uh, uh, a request to see his medical records, wondering, am I going to get a seat to a point? And so they went to Marshall and said, have we permission to release your medical records to the president? And, and Marshall said, yes, but only on one condition, that you let me see them first in hard copy. And he took on the first page and wrote on it, not yet, God damn it. <laughs> 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 By the way, if, if any of you ever get a chance, there is a marvel. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne put together a one-man play called Thirdly. It was uh, it was filmed. It was I saw it live in Los Angeles, and it literally brought me to tears. When it ran in D Washington D.C., HBO filmed it. And I know that there is, that that film is available through HBO. It probably is available on, if you have HBO on, and you search it, it might be still available there. I know that the Santa Cruz Library has copies of it. Uh, I have a copy of it. I'd be happy to loan if anybody wants to see what it. What was the name of it? It's called Thurgood. Oh, did And it's a one man play where Lawrence Fishburne plays Thurgood Marshall and tells his life story. And part of it, a lot of the central core of it is, of course, Marshall was the, or was the lead, argue, lead lawyer for the plaintiffs in Brown versus Board of Ed. I'm going to talk more about this uh, uh, next time. I now have given away one of my joke lines from, the, <laughs> from that lecture. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else? Well, looks like okay. we've come to the end, Arthur. Yeah, I think so. We've been losing some. Of, we're down to forty-six. I say. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope I will see all of you next week. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.